Greetings, comrades. Bienvenidos to this week's edition of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. This week, we got another real banger coming straight at you. My very good comrade Courtney is on to talk about Adam Przeworski's fantastic book in the analytical Marxist strain called Capitalism and Social Democracy from the mid-80s. Now, this book was written in a very different historical context, but one that I think has some really significant similarities, mainly with the consolidation of what was the DSA from a couple of different leftist groups. Przeworski saw the need to provide a much more thorough and in-depth historical analysis of socialist democracy. And I think what's most important here, whenever we consider the rise of DSA or the resurgence of DSA now, Bernie running in 2020, and just the general rebirth of the word socialism on the stage of American politics is that there are deep contradictions, logical contradictions, material contradictions that I think have very, very significant implications for actual political practice being on today's left and how we should think and relate to electoral politics, the Democratic Party in general, and a lot of, I think, pretty critical conclusions about organizing among the working classes on today's left, building alliances across different classes, which is almost a necessity in American politics. So I won't give everything away now, but I think it's a real great episode and I hope it'll really bring a lot to everyone's different ways of thinking and analyzing the contradictions of organizations like the DSA, which might change our actual strategies and approaches to organizing in our own communities now. Really quick, I just wanted to also mention to everyone that I know we've been working on our sound quality, trying to get better with our audio editing skills. It's a work in process. I hope this week's episode, the main discussion will be a higher volume, easier to listen to. So just wanted to let everyone know we're working on it. And while we're trying to do better, we will also never self-crit, you cowards. So you're just going to have to take what you get and just know that we're working as hard as we can on it. Also, we've been building the show's listener base every week, and I'm pretty proud to say that we now have listeners in over 10 countries, places like Mexico, Canada, Pakistan, Libya, Australia, China, Netherlands, Switzerland, and the UK. So big shout out to all of our listeners across the globe, and very happy to have you joining us, and I would call you comrades even if I've never met you. Last but not least, remember to support the show. Throw us a few bucks on Patreon if you feel inclined. Give us a good review on iTunes as that helps more people find the show. And without further ado, let's get into my discussion with Comrade Courtney, and I'll see you back here afterward. Comrade Courtney. Welcome to Red Library, Comrade Courtney. Hello. How are you? I am good. (laughs) Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, I think we have a pretty interesting topic to talk about today, especially, I know we planned this, doing this a couple of weeks ago, but since we talked about it, um, the old man himself, the God King, Bernie Sanders, has announced (laughs) he's running, so um, I'm just now full on bernie bro i've just i've receded back from my insurrectionist third world disposition and i've come back out of the hedges as a as a you know standard bernie supporter yes it's like that bugs bunny meme that we saw the other day where it was like (laughs) i'm sorry lenin but i'm gonna go back to the old me and it's a bernie bernie or a bernie bernie a bernie 2020 (laughs) sticker at the bottom (laughs) so yeah uh i um feeling like a slight itch not a full burn yet though <laughs> you know just, you're feeling like the stove is a little hot but yeah, you're just yeah. not fully it's, on fire it, yet it's like uh yeah it's a little little light little flame <laughs> <laughs> just a little spark a little spark spark <laughs> well i thought of all things to talk about that are like really relevant <clears throat> um and i think have a lot of sort of very personal interest for, I I think for you, this is exactly why I thought you'd be the best person to come on and do this book in particular, um, is the sort of rise or the resurgence, I guess, of DSA and Mm -hmm. democratic socialism. And I know you have, you've dabbled, you have some experience in such things. I won't give too many more details, but 
I thought you would be the perfect person to talk about with this. And also, you and I have had a lot of conversations about this, the DSA in general and sort of the tensions between that and more sort of radical, um, more further left approaches. So I thought mm-hmm. it would be a really cool thing for us to just kind of sit down and hash out. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think talking about the makeup of DSA like now versus what has been going on in the past and then also how that legacy plays out be really interesting to talk about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, let's just sort of state, you know, just kind of outright. So the book that we're going to talk about is um, a book from 1985 by uh, um, Marxist Mm -hmm. theorist. He was kind of an analytical Marxist, which basically means he watched A Beautiful Mind and really likes game theory. And he's like, oh, I'm just going to combine that with Marx. So it's Marx with like the pigeons in the yard. I don't know if you remember that scene. No, I never saw a beautiful mind. All right, episode over. Episode, we're done. We're All done. right, uh, smooth jazz. Smooth now. jazz. We're now just an hour of straight smooth jazz. <laughs> that was lovely. Woody Allen movie commence. Um... Yes, I have not seen Beautiful Mind. I'm well, very sorry. So it's all right. That. You are forgiven. So yeah. you will not be erased from the, the, the pages of the, the history of the left that we're writing currently. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Sorry, that was my that was the little Stalinist in me coming out. I'm gonna apologize do about I, that. Do I still have a key wiki? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we'll add to it. I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I, we'll we'll see how um, you know if you have any reactionary credentials because I feel like no, that's okay, the only okay. thing that would cancel out having a key wiki is if you just like become full blown libertarian or something like that. Sick. Yeah, <laughs> sick, brah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so the book we're talking about is Capitalism and Social Democracy by Adam Przeworski from 1985. Cool. I thought this would be kind of the perfect book to talk about because it really lays out a kind of historical perspective and kind of critique of the legacy of social democratic movements, which I think, you know, the DSA, and this will be interesting to talk about, I think there are some sort of factions in DSA, and some of them seem very much in the lineage of social democratic traditions. Mm -hmm. Um, And other ones seem outside of that and kind of focusing in a different way and understand their like critiques of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think until I had read this book, I realized this was a history I didn't really have a lot, I had some familiarity with, but getting sort of a big picture view, I didn't have one. And so, I don't know, I thought this would be a really cool thing to talk about with AOC and Bernie and like DSA mm-hmm. um, and everything else. So Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to learn more about this book that I have not read yet. <laughs> well, let's talk for a second about DSA, <clears throat> right? So I guess just as kind of a way to set this up and for people to know kind of where, you know, this kind of actual relevance and experience like you're kind of bringing into this like how would you describe the dsa maybe in general but then definitely like maybe the local chapter as well because i I gather they're kind of different in some ways yeah i actually like i know a lot about you know the local chapter and um everyone else kind of in like leftist circles know about austin dsa and uh also you know i i don't know too much about you know other chapters or what that looks like but I think that basically Bernie happened in 2015, 2016. And I think a lot of people were like, oh, cool. I really want to, you know, like, like, fuck Trump. And I wanted to get more involved. Didn't think that, you know, the Democratic Party was anything to write home about because it's not. Um, And uh, (laughs) I don't have to whisper that on this podcast um, or on any podcast. We'll bleep that out. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 (laughs) The boop party. Um, And uh, yeah, no, just they were like, well, fuck, I identify as a socialist. And um, I think DSA is one of the more visible organizations. So I think that's why a lot of people joined it. Um, The Austin organization, I know, jumped from like a few hundred members to like almost 1500 now um, within a span of like two years. So um, yeah, no, it was just a really interesting phenomenon. And um, I always like, you know, even without thinking about what exactly you know my political ideology was but I, I've always been a socialist and that was the most visible to me so I got in and uh yeah made some really good comrades along the way well I think right now it seems that the big question that you know is being argued about incessantly on left book and I guess like <laughs> actually in organizations themselves this is a question of <clears throat> electoral strategy mm-hmm. and what's the relationship between 
being a socialist, wanting socialist transformation, and saying that as needing to go through the institutions of electoral democratic and you know sort of mm -hmm. approaches, and that's the kind of that's the landscape that we have. And so the understanding of, okay, like, well, what's the relationship going to be between being a socialist and electoral politics? Yeah. So I know that that's kind of obviously what the book is about and really trying to show pretty systematically how that has, like what its actual track record has been, which is not good. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess that it's interesting to me that it feels like in some ways we're debating questions around this in a similar way almost as if you would hear these in like 1850. And there's some stuff in the book that we'll get to, but I mean, there are like verbatim quotes from anarchists, socialists and stuff going all the way back to the very beginning of even the word socialism being a thing where this debate was happening from the very beginning of mm -hmm. any kind of radical socialist movement. And it seems like, you know, 160, 170 years later, mm -hmm. it, we're still trying to answer the same question like it's still a constant tension or like contradiction that you know we find ourselves in if sort of electoral strategy is the way that we want to go so i guess like right now how would you describe kind of the perspective in dsa at least you know locally on electoral politics i think for i i think it really kind of differs across the spectrum like the political spectrum in that like there's definitely you know people who are into electoral politics and then there's some people and i i'm not particularly um, invested personally. So I, I guess I can talk like on my own uh, personal, you know, experience in that like the thing that we just don't see or talk about, like it's kind of like the Babadook in the Babadook. <laughs> he, he's kept in the basement and like we feed him every now and then and like yeah, but that's just to me. So, <laughs> but like, I don't know. Maybe I, I feel like that's also putting down the Babadook because Babadook's kind of like cool, right? Mm. Like and edgy, and yeah, he's a he's a symbol of our times. So, but yeah, that, that's that's just the way that I view, you know, electoralism. And yeah, I, I think it really depends on individuals' perspective, which is really interesting. Being in socialist circles, right? Yeah. Talking about individualism. Yeah, so. yeah. 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 Would you say there's kind of a, does it feel like that's the dominant trend right now? Is there kind of a, more of like a, like an ongoing kind of ideological struggle about what role electoral politics is going to play? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of it is kind of like, you do your thing, I'm going to do my thing. Um, oh, okay. And if that thing is like electoral politics, then like, I'm just going to probably stay out of it at this point because there's been, you know, amongst, um, anything to the left of center like some you know uh issues surrounding that so i i think that a lot of people are kind of like uh at, at least you know people that i know are, are like well you know if that's your thing like i guess it's cool but yeah i i think that people kind of stay out of it or jump into it depending on what they align with well maybe thinking about the book i know you like looked over the notes a little bit so i'm curious like prior to us sitting down and like talking about this particular book and the sort of like more of a historical kind of theoretical approach to the question of socialism and electoral politics, I'm wondering, like, what was your general impression of just even the little bit that you saw from the notes in terms of, oh, like, we're going to talk about this and like, why is this relevant or why is this of interest? Um, I, I think that I guess looking at uh, the history of social democracy is really important, especially looking at, you know, what... Ha like like within leftist circles and especially looking at what its failures have been mm. and what we can learn from it and and take into the future um is super important so that we don't just sit with those things and you know allow for you know this watered down version of capitalism to continue on you know because eventually like our democratic process in this country is an incredibly like liberal type of thing so it, it's it's something that we really have to take a good hard look at and kind of look at the history of it and see what we can do with it or in a world that's going to in a world that's going to in look a world. in a world that's going to look really different under socialism um yeah and uh <laughs> when that all happens yeah which i I, I'm being very optimistic. So, yeah, well, if, if the environment doesn't kill us all. 
<laughs> well, of course. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, like where all of this is with the caveat that, you know, the entire world may be underwater in 12 years, but yeah. if it's not, let's try to figure out what a socialist world would look like. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm very open to learning and that's why I'm here today. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, funny enough, that's why I'm here too. Well, <gasps> weird. Uh, weird. How weird is that? <laughs> um, How bizarre. So let's maybe, I guess we can start digging into the content a little bit. You know, I know that I took a lot of notes because I think the history is really dense, but you know, as much as we can, we'll just try to have this be more discussion, dialogue. So, cool. you know, as we go through, like trying to ask questions or like if anything's not clear, because ideally, you know, what we're going for is to make this really dense, complicated history really sort of accessible and understandable for someone who, let's say, has like never even encountered a lot of this stuff before. So that's kind of the idea. So, you know, if I do my job well, it means that it should it should come across that way and and basically ruthlessly critique me and question me, you know, in, in traditional Maoist style whenever I don't say things clearly. <laughs> there will be a struggle session by the end of this. <laughs> oh, I like the sound of that. That's yeah. what I signed up for. It's, just, it's a five-hour struggle session. That's what we're recording. Whenever I hear struggle sessions, I just think of, like, a bunch of, like, bros in a room, like, like hugging each other, like, at the hip. <laughs> Just like, oh, uh, this is a thing. Um, as, so, as yeah. someone who's been in the midst of a few struggle sessions in my day, that is absolutely how it goes. <laughs> Without exception. It's very strange. It's not what you expect. It's not like odd, like sumo wrestler moves. You just go along with it. I don't know what else to say. Oh, it's, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. weird. That's mm. okay. Well, on that note. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's um, set the context of the book a little bit. I thought this was kind of an interesting history that I really wasn't aware of, um, especially, you know, being aware of the rise of the DSA post the, the Trump bump, as I've heard it called. The Trump bump. The Trump bump. But I guess I wasn't aware that the DSA had actually was sort of two different organizations that had <clears throat> um, combined together to form what we now call the DSA. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, like, have did y'all ever talk about that? Or is that sort of part of being in the DSA, like learning that history of sort of the development of it into what it is now? I would say my involvement is very has been very praxis heavy. Mm -hmm. So and I know that we've talked about in the past how you can't really, you know, perform praxis without knowing your theory, but um, I know a little bit about the history of DSA, not too much. Um, isn't there a guy like named Harrington or Yeah, Michael something? Harrington. Okay, yeah, 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 I got the last name. So um, I know that guy existed. Um, I know that there was some things, you know, uh, went along with the Red Scare and mm -hmm. people wanting to differentiate what does socialist mean versus like communist and, mm -hmm. and how does that, you know, fit into our picture of communism on the world stage and, and the USSR, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I think that DSA definitely has an interesting past. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting to bring that up, too. That's something I feel like we forget about so quickly these days is how the, <clears throat> the sort of backdrop of the Cold War and how that really influenced and shaped this whole history of the left in the U.S. I, I mean, definitely from post-World War II on, from mm -hmm. 1945 on. I mean, the, the sort of context of the U.S.'s sort of ideological and sometimes military struggle with the Soviet Union and other communist states is like this huge backdrop that has such a huge impact on like how organizations form, what they thought was the proper strategy, and how to go about bringing about a socialist future, especially in the you know, the imperial core, as we could call it, or like sort mm -hmm. of in the belly of the beast of the U.S. So there was this other kind of interesting thing, too. I was reading up a little bit about the book <laughs> and sort of when it was published. And, you know, one of the things I think we also forget is that the DSA formed in 82, mm -hmm. which was also like right in the midst of this huge conservative backlash of, you know, the Reagan era of sort of the, the rise of the new right, which was, you know, kind of now whenever we think about like W, <laughs> and, and, you know, the Iraq war and I mean, all that stuff, they were sort of bred within the, the sort of heart of this rise of this like new evangelical right, seeing itself mm -hmm. as having this specifically political project to do. So I think it's kind of interesting to me that the DSA was also like forming in the midst of this. Mm -hmm. 
And also after, you know, there are all these like Marxist Leninist parties and what, you know, what we now kind of broadly call the new <coughs> communist movement sort of was collapsing and failing and, and sort of was entering democratic politics in a lot of ways. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, for me, that's kind of a really interesting backdrop to think about, you know, that that stuff shaped what is the DSA and how it's formed and like maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious to see if that's like part of how it continues to exist today, if some of that history is still kind of there in the background. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are people that know about the history, but I think that the organization definitely has morphed into something that is more big tent. Um, and that's kind of what drew me to um, joining is the fact that, you know, I could be multi-tendency as fuck and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, dig into different, you know, theories and things like that. But it's a past that, like, people know about a little bit. But I feel like, including myself, I, I, I don't know all of it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess it's it's interesting, right, that there's this kind of organizational history that I've, I'm always curious about, like in any organization, especially ones on the left. I don't know. I always find it really interesting how much that history tends to be kind of left out. And I think this, I mean, this isn't just about DSA. I think this is pretty broadly for most organizations mm -hmm. that... It's very, I think, very rare that you encounter someone that sort of really contextualizes their organization within like, hey, this is the history of us and how we developed and what this means and how we're sort of grappling with that now. I don't know, maybe that's part of they're not super happy about the history or maybe it's changed to such a degree or there's like different generations of participation. I mean, I don't know. It's interesting. So I was I mostly just sort of curious, like how much that's kind of a discussion within DSA about like yeah. how exactly did we form in the first place? Um. I mean, we've, I, I've definitely uh, heard about it and read Jacobin articles on it and stuff. <gasps> Jacobin. <laughs> so reformist. Oh, so my word. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's, for, that's for another uh, podcast episode. <laughs> that's true. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I definitely can't speak on the whole organization or even, you know. Austin's chapter as a whole it's definitely just my perspective so yeah it's it's like uh just being you know a rank and file member yeah I feel I feel like it's uh stuff that is I, I've dabbled in it but I, I haven't explored fully oh so. well I mean maybe hopefully the book will be even if it's not the specific history it'll at least be a longer kind of perspective on the history of yeah like maybe some of the trends that are still there so yeah yeah Cool. I'm interested in learning more. All right. Well, on that note, let's uh, let's dive right into Carl Kautsky and the Airford Program in 1891. Sick. <laughs> Sick, brah. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, part of where this whole discussion and this whole sort of book has to start from is this very, very large and I think persisting question today about the relationship in, for social socialist parties, socialist communist movements mm -hmm. right around the end of the, the 19th century and how I think even now we look back on these things and we see them as being inherent, being really drastically a failure precisely because of their willingness and perspective on engaging in electoral politics and in, you know, trying to win majorities in parliaments and then the idea of essentially voting socialism <clears throat> into power is now in retrospect seen as this inherently misguided inherently middle class sort of compromised by a bunch of like bourgeois intellectuals mm -hmm. that was the reason why they chose to do it this way um that that scene is kind of the main weakness and why they chose those strategies that they did yeah and i'm sure you've probably heard this critique still today and like circles that you've run in and conversations that you've been in too. Yes. Yes. I've, I've definitely heard that argument. Yeah. I, I've heard, I've heard things all over the board with regards to electoral politics. So it's, it's, uh, I think the majority of people that I've seen or I, I've met that run in just leftist circles in general are very like, feel very iffy about electoral politics they're like i guess we have to deal with this more than like are very pumped about um you know voting people into office or taking part in the process and um i think the question is what would democratic process look like outside of like the liberal structure that we have today and um like yeah like where do we go mm -hmm. from here so that's that's my 
that's kind of my um question that goes through my head whenever this topic comes up and maybe this book will answer that question i don't know well if it's a good book like any good socialist theory book it will not answer any question that you have about anything (laughs) no i think what what i like about this book is i think it does um it at least poses questions i think in a really specific way that you typically don't get whenever Mm -hmm. this conversation comes up so just to kind of get into the material a little bit so i think that like Przeworski's approach is whenever he tries to look back and understand why is it that there was this electoral strategy that was in place. I think what you commonly hear is, is it's almost like this is critiqued as kind of a moral argument. It's that, well, these, these particular groups and these particular movements chose electoral strategies because they weren't able to maintain the purity of their ideals. They were compromised by their class positions. They had sort of lost the radical edge that one should have if one's going to be a socialist. And what I really like about Przeworski's approach, and I think he does what Marx would do at his best, is to say any sort of moral critique is fundamentally going to always fall short and is sort of inherently like a moral critique is also part of this like bourgeois utopian sort of tradition, Mm -hmm. which is precisely what socialism should not be. Mm -hmm. Socialism should always operate from an analysis of material conditions and to really try to critique things based on their, the own contradictions that are sort of at play in any given thing. So, you know, I think for Przeworski, he sees that this turn to electoral strategies in 1891 after the Erfurt program was not so much a, a, a consequence of, you know, weak, weak will or compromised morals, but it was seen as kind of a necessary approach because of the, the way that capitalism was developing at the time. It was almost seen as if, well, the economic developments, we can count on those to be so locked in and so inevitable Mm -hmm. that it's almost as if we could just let socialism develop on its own. And the idea was that essentially socialism will be voted into power because of the way that capitalism is changing the class structure of these particular societies, especially in Western Europe at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a completely different approach than how it gets discussed now. I mean, it's not really ever kind of engaged with that. There was a very clear reason why they thought this was the approach. They weren't necessarily blinded by certain things. Maybe that was part of it. But they're, you know, trying to take them on their own terms and understand there was a reason why they thought this was this was essentially inevitable for socialism to come into power, Um, which I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's something that we don't ever like really talk about now. We just sort of kind of call them revisionists or reformists and then kind of like, you know, Throw them into the dustbin and then keep moving on. I just imagine like a Caesar Milan, like, Ch-. like nope, nope, Ch-. <laughs> nope. Um, I think that the one thing that comes up for me while you were discussing that is the fact that capitalists are going to fight back. Like, yeah, we can, you know, we can elect Bernie, we can elect AOC, but there's always like as as long as you know the structures are in place for capitalism to thrive um in its own way um and destroy other people's lives Mm -hmm. or or destroy people's lives in general i i think that you know it's going to be pretty hard to make the argument that oh we're we're seeing you know we're gonna have like a socialist congress or a social like like it's it's uh there needs to be a change not only on the electoral level but just just across the board if we want a socialist future. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting thing to bring up too because I feel like that's eventually the conclusion that we're going to come to. But sort of leading up to that, you know, just to kind of lay out some of the stuff in the book, I think that what we're really trying to investigate sort of reading through this is that we're trying to understand why workers act the way that they do under capitalism because that's always going to be the question. It's not just, oh, why do socialist movements do X, Y, or Z? But socialist movements are supposed to be organizing the workers. And so we have to ask questions about, okay, what is it for the working class to be an active force in history? Mm -hmm. What does that actually mean? Because even today we talk about that, but, or we say the masses, but I always find it's very, very vague exactly what, what that's going to look like. So we're trying to understand that. And I think that we also have to grapple with this idea that the reason why these particular socialist movements failed is not just because there was like 
ideological domination, that the workers were just so thoroughly inculcated with capitalist ideology or consciousness that they, it was in, inevitable that they were going to fail. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just because of they were brutally repressed by the state. Now, these are both factors, but they can't really account totally for the particular way that these movements developed in you know late 19th century, early 20th century. And I think there's still the questions that we're grappling with now. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, as far as the electoral process goes, some, something that came up for me um, a couple of seconds ago was the fact that, like, you know, I, I guess the way that I see it is like, like, all right, you know, AOC got elected. Bernie gets elected, like if, if he gets elected. Uh, I said it. It's happening. <laughs> Let it be done. You, you've heard it here first. <laughs> um I, my grandpappy is uh, going to be elected. Uh, I'm like, oh, okay, uh, cool. But like, we also, you know, need to look at people's voting records. Um, we need to look at, you know, how their place within, you know, those institutions is perpetuating liberal and even conservative, you know, power structures um, and capitalistic power structures. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that... You know that needs to be um, examined. So, so yeah, uh, it's it's like all right, and but what next? You know yeah. what what what's what are some concrete steps that we can take in order to really make sure that across the board workers aren't getting exploited and people that you know, like I know that we see people that can't work all the time in whatever profession we do mm -hmm. uh, which <laughs> is undisclosed profession x yeah. uh <laughs> uh <laughs> what? so 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 not only you know like like we we do use the word worker and i i think to me that expands beyond you know people that actually clock in to a job every day um or hopefully only a couple of days a week uh but it, it's it goes beyond that to just like w what it takes to exist in our society today just just to exist I think and and like how these different systems are oppressing us and how we can deconstruct them yeah well I think what's sort of what's interesting is that kind of related to that and talking about perpetuation of these structures I think that Przeworski is really trying to key in on this and he has he has this really great way of kind of distilling all this down and saying any movement for socialism under capitalism which we're, whether we like it or not that's the situation we're in so within a capitalist system moving towards socialism that there's always going to be three essential choices that any kind of electoral strategy is going to be faced with well actually i mean even just even before we talk about electoral strategy so first he says that we always have to answer the question of, are we going to seek the advancement of socialism within sort of the existing capitalist institutions that we find, or are we going to go outside of them? So like, first and foremost, that's the choice. Mm -hmm. That is one choice that has to be made. And I think one of the things that will be most interesting for us to talk about with some of these tensions, even if you do get someone elected, is... Are you going to focus on just working classes or is there going to be some need to find like multi-class support or to find allies in different classes hmm. that will guarantee you being able to win enough power to actually implement some sort of program that we could, you know, call socialist in some sort of way. And then the last one is even if you're able to get to that point, are you going to be seeking reforms and improvements or are you going to be working towards the abolition or the complete um, abolition of capitalism as a as a whole way of ordering society mm -hmm. and so like for me like sometimes analytical marxists are just annoying as fuck to read because they they like to talk about math equations and have graphs but they have a way of i think putting things in this really straightforward really kind of boiled down way that has this kind of like analytical precision that I don't know, I found really helpful. Yeah. Like, I've never heard anyone just say, okay, if you're going to be a socialist in a capitalist world, here's the choices you're going to have to make. Look at this graph. <laughs> I think that, I, I think that I think. I think it's a uh, Friday. Happening. <laughs> <laughs> My brain is fried. And you're here uh, to talk about dense-ass Marxist theory. <laughs> you're a <Woo>. saint. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know. You're um, canonized. You're now canonized. Uh, I'm actually very uh, uh, 
I, I, I don't think very highly of myself at all. Uh, anyway, so um, we'll, uh, d- I'll, I'll save that for my therapist tomorrow. <laughs> and um, I, <laughs> what was I going to say? Oh, my question is, mm-hmm. the burning question is, what does democratic process look like um, outside of a capitalistic structure? Because cause I, I want to I wanna, I wanna know, I want to believe that we can do this. Um, and I know we can. I'm just curious as to what it's going to look like. Have you seen anything like that ever in practice? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so cloak and dagger about it. <laughs> it's like I have seen it, but I'm not going to share it with you. <laughs> just it's mine. It's mine. <laughs> it's mine. But but I guess I, I'm like incepting myself in that like it's it's like but it but is this democratic process without capitalism or has democratic process been so like bastardized by capitalism yeah. that like like do we just not know the unknown i i mean it's an interesting thing to bring up i think it's very this is precisely why this whole book and these questions are so important because we're trying to understand <clears throat> what exactly would it look like for something to exist outside the bounds of capitalism? Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, most thinkers, even Marx himself, would get to this point and say, well, we can make maybe very general, vague statements about it. But it's really hard to say what it would what it would look like the day after the revolution. Because mm-hmm. ideally, if we've ab- abolished all pre-existing conditions, it would be a completely new way of ordering society. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have any answers to that. Not yet. I mean, I, I guess that it seems that part of what we have to do to answer that question legitimately is to first understand what what does it mean to understand democracy as being thoroughly embedded in capitalism and how does that shape it? Because I think if we don't understand that, it's going to be hard for us to be able to recognize what a form of democracy outside of capitalism would look like or else would we just basically be recreating the form of democracy that we've sort of grown up with and we've just mm-hmm. kind of experienced it's the only thing we've experienced under capitalism yeah yeah so that's that's my that's my question that's what i think about a lot you know um when we're talking about electoralism and the left and um yeah i i i'm just curious as to what differences there will be will it be a completely different system will it be you know a very similar system but just free of its capitalistic chains I, I i don't know i don't know well i think what prejorsky does that's really interesting is to say that if we're thinking about how is it that democracy mm. under capitalism functions and let's say we're just to keep it very simple if we're just talking about electoral politics in some way I, for me i think what he really keys in on is that that really in the system that we have now uh, what he's trying to investigate is this idea that electoral participation ends up fundamentally undermining working class organization and power. And I think that's something that maybe, you know, is a criticism that gets thrown around, but it's never, I don't think it's ever sort of laid out very clearly that, and it isn't just because, oh, this thing is bad and it's this moral critique. It's that Mm -hmm. there are contradictions within the structural conditions and material conditions of capitalism and organizing worker power under this particular regime that sort of fundamentally undermines its ability to be able to bring about any sort of radical change. And I think what he sees a lot of that stemming from is that anytime that workers and capitalists sort of have to somehow make compromise in any sort of way, particularly over economic issues, that there's this idea that workers are always going to prefer a compromise with a, with the capitalist class versus any kind of radical strategies mm-hmm. or radical changes. I I think that we've kind of come to a time in our world in that maybe some people are starting to wake up and realize that, yeah, this this shit's just not going to work. We have made concessions. We've done that for a very long time. And but I think a lot of people may not know of the fact that we could create, you know, a different system. So that's why they go back to those systems rather than thinking that, you know, oh, this is this is shitty. We're going to become revolutionaries. Um, people will be like, well, you know, that's why we my mom voted for Hillary Clinton, because uh, that's it was it was the fine choice. As she said, I thought it was, you know, a 
terrible choice. But but uh, yeah, like like it it it's a uh, compromising, like you said, and uh, I think that perhaps, um, and, and then we also get into you know the notion of like, well, does that mean that socialist theory is kind of it, it's very you know difficult to reach or grasp if mm-hmm. like you know people are just like well, the fuck is that but I, I think it's more of like you know years and years of the red scare and everything mm-hmm. like that so I, th- I think that you know people are still getting over that but we see a lot of especially millennials and stuff uh, millennials mil- millennials whatever the hell we're mm-hmm. the millennials <laughs> are getting into socialism um so or, says the economist recently yeah but uh, yeah. obviously we don't realize that it's not it's yeah. not the right choice and it's going to fail. So. I, I am quoting The Economist. That's <laughs> You're really an economist shill. That's who I've invited That's, onto the yep. show. That's all right. All I'm, this I'm time. Yeah, all this time. <laughs> Your true form is revealed. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I, think... I am John Galt. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all in some small way? <laughs> we have to kill the John Galt in our heads. <laughs> Sorry. not literally kill i don't want to be sued for any any reason or any any purpose so well i think that going back to sort of even before the reds i mean well there are multiple red scares right like there isn't just like red scare post 1945 there's the red scare post the bolshevik revolution mm-hmm. and i think that you know whenever we think about the sort of history or the context of electoral politics even early socialist movements. So again, some of the history here that's you know maybe helpful and kind of instructive. So a lot of the early socialist movements kind of saw electoral politics as a way to create sort of a society within a society. So we live within a society that also lives within a society, as mm-hmm. gamers and the Joker might say, "Rise up, please." <laughs> um, <laughs> Some men just want to watch the world. <laughs> is that a Joker quote or did I? No, that is a Joker quote. Oh, okay, that's Heath okay. Ledger Joker. Yeah. Oh, that's when he like burns the pile of money. He oh shit! No, it's Michael. It's Michael Caine. It's oh, Alfred says that oh, about man. about the Joker. Some random criminal in India that he used to encounter, which is maybe hyper colonialist and racist. I've never thought about that, but wait, really? Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember yeah. that part. All right. Well, maybe we should now just completely. <laughs> I guess the Dark Knight is problematic. We need oh, to throw it out. Oh man. Now. I just remembered it looked really good on my 1080p <laughs> screen. That that really is all that matters. 55 inch. Don't worry about the legacy of British colonialism and mass violence and destruction. Anyway, moving on. So I think that voting was seen, and this is what I find really interesting, talking about the kind of changing class structure under capitalist development in this particular period, is that what was generally seen by most socialists is that the more that capitalism exacerbated issues of inequality and more and more people were sort of pushed into what we could call the proletariat or the working classes, you know, this is also happening at the same time that universal suffrage is starting to become an actual historical reality for more and more people. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of interesting trend of how more and more people are being pushed into the working classes at the same time that more and more people are getting the right to vote. And, you know, if you think about it, if you're a Marxist around this time, you have this idea that history is developing in this really structured, predictable way. And, you know, the way the way that you would think about this is to say, well, essentially, whenever capitalism is going to be overthrown is whenever more and more people are pushed into the working classes and develop class consciousness about their position in the economic structure and the political structure, and then we'll organize together and we'll overthrow the order as it exists. So if if you see that, okay, well, like more and more people are being pushed in the working classes, there is a rise of socialist movements. I mean, just, just a little bit of a background on this that I found really interesting. So whenever socialist movements and these parties started to organize and come into power, they were growing like exponentially. It would be that over a course of so let's say 27 years. So in Finland, the Social Democratic Party in 1890 was 19%. That was the mm-hmm. amount of electoral uh, gains that they had in parliament. <coughs> so they go from 19% in 1890, and then by 1907, they had 37%. Hmm. And in Germany, I think it was something around 17% around the same time. And by 1912, they were 34.2%. And they were actually the largest 
they were the largest faction within parliament at the time. So, you know, I can imagine being a socialist and Marxist at this time, and this would absolutely seem a confirmation of all your ideas of this is how history develops. This is how capitalism is overthrown. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that, well, essentially, we don't even need to do anything. The history, the wheels of history are going to turn on their own. More people are going to be able to vote. And because we're winning more and more of these gains in parliament through electoral politics, essentially, we just sit back and let socialism come into being. And I think that whenever we talk about electoral politics now and we look back on these movements, I think it's very, very easily lost that at the time, this was a very, very common way to think about Marxism. It wasn't everyone who thought who was a Marxist thought about it in this way, but it was very general. I think a very common trend. People like Kautsky, people like Bernstein, who were sort of the leading. I mean, some of I mean, I think it was. I think it was Kautsky who was called like the Pope of Marxism. So these were seen as the leaders of theorizing and politics for the the socialist vision of the world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even them, if they're sort of buying into this particular view of history and development, I don't know, it makes a lot of sense to me that looking back on the time, I would, I could understand why they would think that, even if obviously they ended up being horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I mean, I'm curious, like, have you... I don't know, have you ever like encountered any kind of discussion about that history or like just general sort of takes on, well, this is what it was to be a socialist at this time and and think that electoral politics were the answer? Not really so much. The only time that I really ever encountered that was when I was doing my undergrad degree in history. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I uh, specialized in Holocaust and genocide studies. So learned a lot about, you know, uh, how social Democrats were viewed in um, Weimar Germany and mm-hmm. everything and uh, people that identified as socialists. So it, it's a uh, that's really the extent to which I know about it. And uh, look how that turned out. Yeah. And I can womp, say womp. that because I'm Jewish. <laughs> you can. You have rights on this show to say that yes, in any I way do. you see fit. <laughs> well, I think you had kind of mentioned a few minutes ago uh, something that I think Przeworski hits on too, <clears throat> that the main question about this particular strategy, and I think we have to say this is historically validated in some way, or it is. it was a historical question and we saw this happen, was even if you could when large majorities in these parliamentary institutions, in this electoral process, there was no guarantee that the bourgeoisie, those classes, the capitalist classes, were going to respect that exact order that they kind of demanded that you participate in. Mm -hmm. And so the question, I mean, even in like 1905, so a leading figure in the German Democratic Party at the time, August Babel, actually said that even if we win huge gains in parliament and we gather this huge electoral base of support, that revolution may still be necessary, even if it's just as a defensive measure against the inevitable reaction of the capitalist classes and the bourgeoisie. And I think that's still a question today that I find really pretty interesting and and kind of, um, I don't know, it's one that still strikes me as being very relevant, but kind of fraught with a lot of danger that let's say that even if you could win a huge percentage of, let's say, the House or the Senate, or even someone in the office of president who identified as a socialist, Mm -hmm. you know, if they really fundamentally want to bring about an abolition of capitalist relations and the economic order, you know, the question is, are they going to defend that, those interests violently Mm -hmm. if necessary? I mean, I think the history Mm -hmm. proves that they absolutely will. They always have. And so I don't know, not to say that essentially that everyone in, you know, who thinks that you should pursue electoral politics as a socialist should also be, you know, hoarding weaponry and like learning (laughs) how to do like jujitsu, but maybe they should, I don't know. But I just, I'm curious like what your thoughts are on this idea that even if you were to win electoral electoral gains and like mm-hmm. when a majority you know i don't know that it doesn't guarantee that the the capitalist classes are going to respect like yeah. your ability to win that majority yeah yeah and and i think you know maybe i guess my you know something that came up for me uh throughout our talk here is uh is there a problem 
you know, does the problem is the problem in the fact that electoral politics are so vertical in nature as opposed to, you know, we talked about, you know, the workers and, and the working class and, um, you know, we talk about uh, and, and Marxist theorists talk about the dictatorship of the proletariat. So, like, are we is is the problem that we're putting, you know, certain people up on a pedestal, you know, and that that still replicates you know, capitalist structures. Mm. Um, so that's something that comes up for me in that. Yeah. And why I think some of this stuff is questionable. Yeah. Well, I think you kind of hit on a couple of key points that Prejworski brings up too. I think something about this kind of vertical structure <coughs> that I think is really relevant too is Prejworski has this interesting commentary on the history of that whenever socialism was tried to introduce into workers as a whole, as sort of the masses, that socialism was seen as being this like very bizarre kind of alien outside force that was originating in the middle classes themselves. And I think this is something that still persists today as a problem. And mm -hmm. it's something that is still so, it seems strange that we constantly keep grappling with this problem without much of a historical perspective on how this has been approached before. Mm -hmm. So the idea that this kind of vertical nature of how socialism was seen as being something that needs to be introduced was actually kind of the thing that created a lot of resistance mm -hmm. among the workers themselves and kind of ends up fundamentally undermining how even whenever workers become a vast majority, well, I guess that's kind of interesting, like workers in all of these countries never become the majority in terms of, population and how many you can say this percentage of people are quote unquote workers are quote unquote the proletariat. Mm -hmm. So if your whole strategy is based on, well, if we, if more and more people are going to be classified as workers, if eventually that never happens, then you're always fundamentally going to come up short with being able to win big enough majorities in these sort of electoral processes that allow you to sort of implement socialism in any real meaningful way. Mm hmm. Does that kind of make sense? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I guess like that's kind of what I find interesting is that this kind of like vertical top-down perspective, how that is, has kind of always been a problem of, oh, how are we going to structure a socialist organization? What is the relationship between that and democracy? Mm -hmm. And will it always be this sort of like top-down hierarchical sort of approach? And a, a sort of, I think, a, a lack of critically reflecting on how much that is also part of the relations of capital that we're also yeah. dealing with at the time. I, I think that, you know, a lot of, and, and people throw around the word like progressive, like it, it means, means nothing anymore, you know? Mm. Oh, look at this progressive organization. Look at this, you know, real like, you know, forward thinking. And, and a lot of those, you know, a lot of those organizations and, and none in Austin on the left in particular, but, but a lot of groups of people, can think of specifically nonprofits that mm. mimic, you know, um, the power structures and yeah. dynamics of capitalism. So that's something that, you know, I think we really, I, I think that's what we're going to have to uh, fight against is, mm -hmm. is, you know, not replicating those power structures and uh, what that's going to look like. And, and of course, you know, there's going to be people that, you know, are more invested in a project than others and things like that. And that's, you know, I think that's a little different than, you know, having somebody essentially like rule over mm -hmm. others and in, in that they, you know, make uh, decisions as to how much people get paid or, or uh, and then they get paid more and, and uh, you know, um, you know, without anyone's input uh, besides, you know, what the market looks like yeah. uh so i think we we need to be very cautious of that especially for again if we're, if we're talking about nonprofits <laughs> or or i guess like organizations that are outside of the corporate world mm -hmm. yeah i think a lot of it does come down to there are these contradictions inherent in these things and we have to sort of understand that the way that those relations are completely developed within a system of capital and how, you know, we have to be very cautious about what we're replicating. And I think that entails having to step back and understand, well, what, what are the relations of capital? And I think that's a really hard question to answer. I think that that's why 
sort of all the theory work comes into play. Mm -hmm. I think it can be easily dismissed as being just solely the product of like academia or people who are divorced from like actually organizing workers. And I mean, you know, maybe to some degree that's true, but there are Mm -hmm. ways that they were trying to answer questions of precisely why did all of this exact kind of electoral strategy, the idea that the dictatorship of the proletariat was inevitable, why did this not occur? I mean, an interesting little historical fact is even Engels in in 1891 basically said that electoral politics was the form of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Like, that's Mm. all you needed was electoral politics. Hmm. And the dictatorship of the proletariat was going to come about. And Lenin was incredibly pissed off at him saying this, you know, for good reason, whenever you look at the situation in Russia. But I do think that, you know, it's still these same kind of contradictions and tensions that we're still grappling with today. Well, maybe just in the interest of time, you know, whenever we think about this whole book, I think that its main argument can really be kind of boiled down into, speaking of contradictions, laying out a few contradictions that are always present if you're operating and sort of wanting to bring about a socialist revolution in any sort of way or any kind of change towards a socialist society, but seeing electoral politics as being kind of the way to do that. So Mm -hmm. maybe I can just kind of try to lay this out and then we'll kind of talk about it and then wrap up a little bit. Yeah, sounds good. So I think for Przeworski, to try to encapsulate all this, he sees the main contradiction here being that socialist parties never were able to win the vast majority of support among the workers they claim to represent. So there's always this tension about a small group uh, or relatively small group of socialists political organizers, political leaders who are claiming to represent, quote unquote, the masses in any sort of way, especially the masses of workers, because they failed to win the majority of support that they thought they would win or that they needed to win, you know, maybe possibly because a lot of the workers didn't see socialism as this thing that was sort of inherent and organic to their own experience, but was something introduced from the outside. So they, they eventually realized that they can't win enough support among the workers themselves to win a big enough majority to implement their program in parliament. So they necessarily start to say, well, we have to build alliances with other classes precisely because we can't win this majority with workers that we that we need. Mm. And for Prejwarsi, he sees that as soon as they start doing this, mm-hmm. you're going to have to compromise the radical yeah. nature of and revolutionary potential of your program. And even he has this interesting historical example that even in Belgium in 1912, that was the only time in the history of Western Europe and all of these social democratic movements that they were able to win a majority of support among the Mm -hmm. workers, but it very quickly diminished. And this is a really interesting historical problem Mm -hmm. is that even whenever they won that support, it only existed for a very brief time and then drastically drastically started to fall back into the single digits or like the the low teens in terms of how much support they had so you have the situation where out of necessity to win power they have to see themselves entering these interclass alliances oh i i think there needs to be a mass movement that is so much more you know electoral politics and i think that People are also, like, if we're talking about, you know, 21st century America, whatever, there shouldn't be borders or countries. Uh, anyway, uh, Just throw that out there. so uh, I have to make everything known. So anyway, I, I think that, you know, a big part of that are, is people are, you know, very, they, they feel very wary of uh, electoral politics and rightfully so. So I think that needs to be... We need to take a good hard look at that. Well, I think kind of in relation to that, too, and thinking about Bernie's run for 2020 and AOC, what I think Prejwarsi really hits on that I think for me was a new way to think about this, but seems really powerful and really relevant is that, you know, whenever you're you're seeking any kind of interclass alliance for an electoral strategy, you no longer can organize and run on a platform that specifically focused on the interests of workers as like a coherent unified class. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is you are kind of out of necessity forced (laughs) to have to find things that are commonly shared among a whole range of different class positions. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, to be honest, a lot of these I think are still present today that were there 
sort of in the early 20th century. So just a couple of examples of this. So he started to, well, Przeworski sees that part of what they had to see is kind of uh, shared among classes that they could build this alliance on mm-hmm. were different kinds of credits to the petty bourgeoisie, mm-hmm. um, pensions to salaried workers, minimal wages to workers, which, you know, I think is a pretty radical thing to consider how that could be sort of a shared kind of class program to run on. Um, especially when we think about fight for 15 and like, you know, raising $15 minimum wage, Mm -hmm. um, which isn't the exact same thing, but it's an interesting idea that minimum wages was seen as a sort of interclass issue that people could organize around Um, consumer protections, family allowances, all these sorts of things. So whenever I think about electoral strategy today, I think there are still these really challenging questions that we have to answer about whenever we're no longer organizing around like specific class interests, but programs that are shared among a whole vast array of classes that we can build inter class support around, you know, I think these tensions and like sort of this contradiction is still there. Like you have to run, like you're running on a platform of socialism, which fundamentally would want to undermine private property, Mm -hmm. wealth inequality, and all Mm -hmm. of these other things. But you're sort of dependent on building an alliance with other classes that are very supportive and like pro-capitalism that benefit from capitalism. And so it's kind of this catch-22 of like you have to organize with them if you're going to do electoral politics, unless at some point we're going to see that an unprecedented situation happens and you could win 100% of support among all workers everywhere. But if that doesn't happen, you're sort of kind of forced into this really deep contradictory choice of we have to organize based on these broad platforms, but we're going to undermine our ability to mm-hmm. be socialist to do that. Mm-hmm. I guess I guess the thing that comes to mind for me is how does theory play into what the worker wants, you know, and what we envision the dictatorship of the proletariat to look like and, uh, you know, how that differs amongst different types of workers and things like that it's it's just and um but at the same time individualism is garbage so Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like it's it's like shit it's a like you said a catch-22 when it comes to that and I I think that we have but I, I think at the same time remaining an optimist that we could figure it out well, I think for Przeworski, too, where he ends up coming down on as a way to get out of this kind of catch-22 is that if if you decide to engage in electoral politics in this way, you know, if you look at the history of this, whenever John Maynard Keynes developed his economic theory, it sort of provided this tool for a lot of these social democratic parties to figure out this is how we're going to run the economy that still, in all intents and purposes, is still capitalist, right? Mm-hmm. So essentially, the capital, the economy is still functioning as a capitalist economy, even under social democratic power in in parliaments that had been won through electoral processes, right? So there's this way that whenever we think about this catch twenty two, the only way that socialism would ever be able to operate outside of that is socialism that isn't going to be based on the guarantee of capitalist profits having to fund the social welfare programs that socialism is trying to implement in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting part of this history is that there's a really key criticism here that if you do gain power and if you do want to implement these, you know, reforms in terms of social structure and economics and inequality and all this other stuff, you know, it's always been inherent in the sort of social democratic sort of um, choice that you have to make in the conundrum and the sort of material circumstances that you have to be dependent on the capitalist economy still generating Mm -hmm. profit. Yeah. And so it's only with that, that surplus, uh, you know, resource, that profit that the economy as a whole is making can then be redistributed for the bigger, greater benefit of all. And so until you figure out a way to get outside of that, and to, for Przeworski, he sees organized socialism as a broad social movement that mm-hmm. isn't just specifically tied to electoral institutions. Yep. You're always going to be end up getting trapped in this this contradiction of being a socialist in a capitalist world. Mm-hmm. You know? And I, I think that the question, like like something else that came up for me is like you know the difference between electoralism and democratic process. Mm. You know, and and then also. Yeah, just 
I, I would love to see, you know, systems. Well, well, I guess would the systems even exist if capitalism didn't exist? No, but, but I, I, you know, I think we'd still need for people to, uh, kind of, uh, mutually help each other. But, but I, I think it would look different than, you know, the systems that we have in place now. But anyway, yeah, like, like what essentially, how, how that will play out in, um, our socialist future is kind of a question to be asked or to, to be curious about and I feel like I'm going to walk away from here with a lot of questions no I think (laughs) in a good way (laughs) yeah I think rightly so too I mean one of the things that kind of ends the book is this sort of key question which is will workers will people in general pursue material interests Mm -hmm. if they're pursuing their material interests which we always say is that's essentially what leads to economism, right? This idea that, well, we're just going to win these short-term economic gains and that's going to be our main focus. So for me, the question that I come away with is if people are under this particular system of capitalism, the way it's organized, and even socialists like electoral parties themselves have to inevitably kind of focus on winning short-term material gains just to gain power in the first place, will that sort of you know, choice to pursue material short-term gains, Mm -hmm. will that ever be able to lead to any kind of socialist system? Or is it ever going to be a, how will anyone ever make the choice to pursue something that isn't just short-term economic gains Mm -hmm. that you actually need to bring about a socialist future in any sort of way? So it's kind of inherently an irrational choice to choose socialism under the conditions as they exist. And that's what's tricky about it, I think. I think I think that's why you know there just needs to, there needs to be a shift away from individualism and and uh, ownership um, and uh, yeah so so I think that it's going to require that because I I think we weren't we weren't born socialist or were we I don't know uh, but <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a gene for being a socialist <laughs> I don't know man. My my dad was from a <laughs> from a, a socialist uh, state, so who knows? Maybe I don't know. But uh, anyway, so I, I'm thinking that you know there just there really needs to be um, a shift, and that it should come from the proletariat. And and we also like like and you know I think I think something that people will do, especially when we're looking from a top down like capital driven perspective is underestimate the proletariat and you know uh think oh well li- like make blanket statements you know about the like how learned <laughs> the proletariat are it, it, it's just it's just like we we need to make that shift within our um you know amongst other workers well maybe to wrap up and just to kind of offer you know for me what i kind of take from this Um, I think obviously a lot of the stuff that I found really interesting had to do with this like inherent contradiction in pursuing electoral strategies for a socialist future. But I think the other thing, and I think this goes back to Marx as well, is that, you know, under these conditions that capitalism creates this huge superabundance of resources and materials and wealth in a way that prior to the development of capitalism, Mm -hmm. the world has never seen. So in a lot of really interesting ways, it does create these conditions for freedom, but it never can fulfill those in any sort of real way. And if there's anything that socialism offers, and I think you're kind of, you've been describing this really, really, I think really saliently in this conversation is that what socialism is trying to offer is the pursuit of democratic process that actually maximizes freedom that brings about liberation and mm-hmm. autonomy and power for for the masses yeah. of people in a real way and you know what's so tricky is is we're in a system that fundamentally creates the conditions for seeing that as being possible but always undermines us actually achieving that and if they're if you know if being a socialist means anything it means pursuing liberation for for the masses precisely in opposition to the system that creates the conditions for it, but can't mm-hmm. actually satisfy it. And I think, I don't know, it's always been the problem. It's still the problem today. Yeah. And it's incredibly complicated to figure out how the hell do you actually do that? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe for you, like what, I don't know, what do you, what do you find you took from 
you know, this book or this particular sort of Przeworski's history, his analysis? I don't know. What do you find yourself asking or wanting to take away? Um, I, I think that kind of the the fact that I feel like capitalism has infiltrated so much of the way that we think in that, you know, especially in, you know, this part of the world, um, you know, and as the people that we are, and I mean, we in that, you know, just blanket statement about a lot of people and, and that th- that's something that I feel like no matter how woke we can get that we need to remember and always learn from and and that's something that you know I really that's like my my one and only strength (laughs) sorry I have to be a self-deprecating uh Jew sometimes all the time is that I I that I value learning and 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 by by learning, I don't mean, you know, and I, I also mean that we have to, you know, break out of capitalist structures mm-hmm. in that, you know, a lot of our education is based off of, you know, liberalism and, and you know, individualism and um, all that nonsense. So we have to look beyond that. It's not just our, our future in, you know, education and socialism is, isn't going to look necessarily the way that we know it either. So I think that we always have to be open to learning and and uh, new ways of running ourselves and uh, yeah, and that electoral politics has a lot of a lot of issues that we gotta we gotta look at. So yeah. and uh, you know we're we're trying to do a big thing here by you, you know dismantling capitalism, dismantling the structures as they are now. It's it's some, big shit to do like like it's we're not i think you once said to me we're not just playing revolutionaries (laughs) like we're actually (laughs) you know like like we're trying to get this stuff done and i'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like because i'm just little me but i uh but i look forward to seeing it happen and i look forward to participating in, in it and to contributing to it yeah yeah we're definitely not here just to larp yeah. That's for sure. We're not. Although I am dressed as Mao Zedong right now. <laughs> this is my this is my Friday LARPing cosplay outfit. And I, I cosplay Zhao and Lai or something like that. Um, okay. Well, I know um, that's probably a good place for us to end. Yes. So, Comrade Courtney, thank, thank you. you so much for being on Red Library. Thank you. Um, would you ever want to come back for another episode? Definitely. If there's a book you want to do or an article yes. or anything else, we can trade off. That would be great. I would love to do that. Cool. And uh, yeah, I know that someone special in my life will eventually come on the show too. So Yeah, he will. He um, he called the podcast Guapo Trap House, which <laughs> I told him since he said that he's now <laughs> obligated to come on the show. So He's very handsome. <laughs> he is. He's a good looking man. Yes. He says that he would like uh, Danny DeVito to <laughs> uh ruin him so um yeah. yeah no i support that that's fine <laughs> it's fine i'll sleep on the couch you're very progressive yes thank you i am woke as they say you are you have you are wearing your woke uh merit badge right now and i know okay. i've seen your wokeness certificate of authenticity so i know that you are <laughs> legit so uh yes next time i won't have a true crime thing to get to <laughs> fair, I'll, fair I'll carve out more time well i was hoping you'd sit here <laughs> and say. and play five hours of uh free jazz or i guess smooth jazz sorry that oh. was where mine went it was like five, five hours, hours. Free, jazz. <laughs> free jazz um we're gonna dj 24 hours everything of, will be free <laughs> the yeah. true the only true socialist yeah. jazz is free jazz you won't know what free means because everything will just be it um, jazz for all that's jazz, my program jazz that i'm gonna run on but the, it's a number four and then all is spelled with a number four as well instead of an a <laughs> jazz for fall uh <laughs> and um yes so thank you for listening this isn't my normal voice i don't know why i spoke like this the whole time but thank you just you. do radio voice it's inevitable yes okay all right cool till next time uh Das Vidanya, comrade. <laughs> Nostrovia. <laughs>
All right, y'all. That does it for this week. Hope you enjoyed listening to that discussion with myself and comrade Courtney as much as I had actually having the discussion. One of the things I was most excited about with Courtney coming on to talk with me about Prejorski's book in particular is that she has a hell of a lot of experience actually doing organizing, being really involved in different groups like DSA, and also has a hell of a sense of humor and some pretty mad smooth jazz mouth flute skills. I don't know. We're, that's what we're going to call them. So I had a great time and uh, hopefully we'll have her back on real soon for another episode. One of the things that we are trying to do is make a lot of this really complex history and theory very beginner friendly. So I'm going to put some links in the show notes to check out uh, a couple of things in the Airfort program, maybe a few other references just so you can read to get a little bit more context. You know, one of the great things about podcasting is it's a very accessible format. And one of its downsides can be that it's very difficult to dig through all of this complex material and present it in a way that is thorough and comprehensive without being completely overwhelming. So we're going to keep working on that, keep fine tuning our approach here on Red Library to make it as relevant and as informative for you out there, our very good comrades and listeners. So this particular episode only scratches the surface on this topic. So I would really encourage you to check out Przeworski's book, check out the links I'll put up in the show notes, and really just use this as a starting point and use it as a way to open up discussions with your own comrades and people that you organize with that you know are really involved in leftist politics and really try to broaden the discussion and our own critical analysis on something as important and as visible right now in American politics as democratic socialism and organizations like the DSA. As always, if you'd like to support what we're doing here on Red Library, please head over to iTunes, give us a review that helps people find the show, like us on Facebook, you can find our Patreon, give us a little bit of those material supports if you want to, just to help us improve things like our equipment, getting materials for the show. And as always, ruthlessly indoctrinate your friends and family, coworkers, random passerbys with our message here by telling them about the show or even forcing them to listen to it in a very Stalinist authoritarian way. Who am I to critique your tactics? We're all about diversity of tactics. And really quick, I just want to give a big shout out to Comrade Don, who was on episode one for doing the editing on this podcast. He did a great job, and I'm very happy to say he's going to be helping us out to lighten up the workload on future episodes. Next week, I'm going to have Comrade David on to talk about David Graeber's very excellent book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years. So I hope you'll look forward to that one. I think it's going to be another real banger. We're all about making real bangers on this show. So until next Sunday at 7 p.m., keep fighting, keep reading, keep writing, keep thinking, keep critiquing, keep flossing, whatever it is you do. Let's make this leftosphere critical, vibrant, strong, and I'll see you back here next time.